This is our second course on postmodernism. Last time we took a look at the possible birth date of postmodernism, the moment when a uh, highly praised residential complex was demolished, thus putting an end to the claim of uh, modernism of explaining in a rational way the world. We also took a look at the way Postmodernism attempted to close that great divide between high and low art, and it took interest in uh, popular literature in genres such as science fiction and um, uh, detective fiction. Now we will take a look at this. I have Hassan's Catena of Ten Features of Postmodernism, one of the early attempts to systematize a bit the main characteristics of postmodernism. I chose here of the 10 features 7, which I consider to be the most prominent. It should be said that some of the features of postmodernism um, listed by Hassan now appear maybe dated because they refer to an early experimental phase of postmodernism. So let's take a look at these seven features. Some of them were previously uh, tackled. Some of them were discovered by you in the seminars we had over the last uh, three or four weeks. The first one would be decanonization. This obviously comes from a word we came across, you remember? Canon. Canon. What is canonic? What is recommended? What is official in a culture? All cultures, you remember this discussion from our talk about the Victorian literature, all cultures end up creating their own canons. Those canons are generally made by um, scholars, by cultural critics, by teachers, professors, who end up in becoming textbook names, street names, common names. However, one of the most uh, uh, troubling features of postmodernism is, is exactly this, the collapse of the canon, the rejection of the canon. But what is different now is that not just one historicized, one particular canon is rejected, but pretty much every canon. And let's take a look at this French a uh, critic, it's, he's not even a literary critic, Jean-François Lyotard, was invited by the Canadian government to write something which was called Le Rapport sur les Savoirs, Report on Knowledge. A very interesting thing, the Canadian government thought that they needed the insight of a philosopher and of a cultural critic to realize where the society was going. I wish politicians would do that more often. And Lyotard was uh, invited to, to explain, to detect what were the tendencies in, in uh, contemporary society. This, this was happening in the 70s, it's already 50 years before. You're going to see later that Lyotard, among other things, was to discover or to predict the fact that postmodern societies were going towards an age when knowledge becomes a universal commodity, no longer the province of a few learned or powerful people. In many ways, we can look at him as someone who, without knowing anything about the internet, obviously, he anticipated the uh, type of revolution that the internet brought to our societies. Here's one sentence he formulated, and which is very famous now. It goes like this. He speaks about a massive delegitimation of the master codes in society. Delegitimation as a rejection of their legitimacy, a collapse, a decline. But what are these master codes he speaks of? Well, by master codes, he actually understands all kind of theories, all kind of major discourses that try to explain the world in all its components, such as religious systems, 
then there would be philosophies, all of those philosophies that were trying to give a unified vision of the world. Again, no more a single philosophy, be it Plato, Aristotle, David Hume, uh, Kant, could claim to explain the world. And then it would be also grand social and economic theories, like Marxism. Yeah? Marxism attempted to suggest that the world goes from a class ruled society in, in dominated by oppression towards a classless society in which the working classes will, will be ruling. Uh, or in a similar way, the theory of liberalism, of laissez faire, implies that the market self regulates itself and is able to solve everything. We can see now with the coronavirus crisis that it's not really going. That, for instance, in America, the market, if left alone, would crush the lives of so many people who are now left out of jobs. And then also master codes could be all kind of myths, like the myth of progress. We believe things are going to be better. We believe in growth, economic growth. We believe technology will produce better and better things that will improve our lives. However, after the Holocaust, after the communist aberration, the gulag, the atom bomb, terrorism as well, this doesn't seem so obvious any longer. Now, master codes were given other names by Lyotard. At some point, he called them les grandes histoires or meta récits. The French uh, terms were translated into English as meta narratives. I would have liked if they were called the grand histories. That's a much nicer term. And what Lyotard is saying in his Rapport sur le savoir is that such grand histories, yeah, religions, philosophies, uh, economic theories, are falling apart. They can no longer claim to explain all the world. So we have to reject them. And instead of them, what do we have? Well, we have le petit histoire, the small histories, local histories, local explanations that make sense in a particular situation. They can no longer they no longer have the claim to solve everything. So this is what decanonization looks like. Already the screen is very packed, it's very messy, and well, maybe this is it. It's messy. Let's move on. Carnivalization. Uh, it looks very funny. Carnival, you think of the carnival in Rio, carnival in Venice. But actually the term here is used in a rather specialized uh, sense. And we have to go back, uh, and this is something that uh, actually Ahab Hassan doesn't, yeah? but he kind of presupposes we know about this. We have to go back to this Russian author, Mikhail Bakhtin. Mikhail Bakhtin launched some of the most widely uh, recognized uh, ideas of the century, even if he wrote from a, from a dictatorship. And um, the idea of Carnival was advanced by him in this book, Rabelais and his world. Rabelais is a French writer, the author of Gargantua and Pantagruel, as you probably know, who marked the transition, according to uh, Bakhtin, from a uh, literature inspired by popular traditions towards a uh, cultivated literature. It's still he says, retains, maintains many characteristics of popular literature. The language is kind of um, rugged, uh, gross at some times. The imagery is uh, full of life. And there is some kind of lack of style almost in, in what he does. Bakhtin's point is this, that Rabelais would be like a landmark in literature. He would be probably one of the last authors to still embody, incorporate, encapsulate in his, in his writing the ideas of popular literature and the idea of the carnival. Now, that's an image of, of the carnival. It's a famous image painted by um, the Dutch painter Bruegel, the elder. And 
you can see what the carnival was about, yeah? Popular entertainment. And um, Bakhtin tells us uh, in, in the carnival you have a familiar free interaction between people, you have eccentric behavior, you have all kind of mismatchings, misalliances, uh, as he calls them, carnivalistic misalliances. And you also have sacrilegious behavior, outrageous behavior. Th these are still preserved in uh, Rabelais. I would also add one other critic, or couple of critics here, Stalibras and White. These two authors wrote a very influential uh, book in which they started from, from the, these uh, images of the carnival and discussed them in, in terms of reversals. So they say that there are three types of reversals happening in the public place during the carnival. One of them is the reversal between high and low body. Normally, we kind of only mention our higher body, the head, the mind, the eyes. All love poems are about these, and not the lower body. Well, now there is a lot of borediness, a lot of obscenity in the carnival. Half-naked people, um, sometimes display of genitalia. There is also then another type of reversal. The image you see, see here is a so-called king of the carnival. This is a grotesque image of someone who obviously doesn't look like a king. He's just a peasant. Uh, and you can see the people around him stage the masquerade. He's riding something that should be a horse, but instead it's just a barrel. He has a gun, which instead it's just a pig on a pit, I think. Yeah. He's not wearing a crown, but some kind of pan. So all of this is grotesque, ridiculous, absurd. And in the terms of Stanley Rice and White, that's one of the reversals the car carnival makes room for. A reversal between classes, the poor people, frustrated. Now, for one day, they take the lead. This is like a very good idea, if you think, of letting the pressure vent out, yeah, the social frustration vent out for one day. And the last type of reversal is a reversal between high language and low language. Normally, we appreciate just the high language. This is the language of canonic literature. You see the connection with uh, canon. But under the carnival, body, obscene language is perfectly tolerable. But the connection I want to make here is that carnivalization, as invoked by Ihab Hassan, might refer to this, to the reversal of high and low language, high and low culture, high and low literature. No more a hierarchy of the two. Yeah. So this is basically something we spoke about, the suppression of the barriers between low culture. You have plenty of examples here cheap dime novels, you know, fantastic novels, gangster stories, uh, detective mysteries, erotic literature, science fiction, all of these uh, disregarded normally by the high bro critic. And this is also called low bro literature. And traditionally, yeah, these were completely dominated in the public discourse, in the, uh, in the canon, by high culture. Yeah, big books like these, William Shakespeare, Homer, Jane Austen, Dickens, you know, all the big guns. Now, according to Hissen, according to Leslie Fiddler, what happens now is the barrier between these is demolished. And in the eyes of the postmodern author, popular literature, pulp fiction, is in no way of lower quality or of lower interest than the works of the classics. And this is something we already discussed. You remember that nowadays it doesn't mean that postmodern literature is going to turn itself completely. It's going to surrender to bad taste or to the low instincts. It just means that from time to time, postmodern art is adopting some of the strategies you saw in the detective novel, in the erotic novel, in the science fiction, only to regain a lost public. You remember our complaint about modernism. This was a big problem with the modernists. 
the modernists, while writing books that were increasingly sophisticated, full of references to the classics, to mythology and all of that, in this process, they ended up losing the public. And now the postmoderns are trying to regain that public. Now, another feature, fragmentation. Fragmentation is something I'm quite sure you already noticed while reading both The Floating Opera and um, those two books by, by Vonnegut, uh, Slaughterhouse uh, Five and uh, A Blue Beard. Yeah, you could see that they, they seem to be made like a, like, a, like a mosaic of all kind of, you know, shards of broken fragments, some bits of diary, bits of personal history, uh, pieces from the newspaper. You remember in the last book you read in Prague, you even had some, some posters inserted in the book. So there are several several things that uh, fragmentation implies. It, it, it refers, for instance, to collage, yeah? points to the, the old art of collage, which is not a novelty. Yeah? A lot of the modernist painters who were masters of collage, Braque, Picasso. I, I should also add, for instance, that one of the uh, great artists of postmodernism, Donald Barthelmy, not by accident, he was working as a curator in a museum in Biloxi, and there he worked a lot with such modernist um, artwork that implied a lot of collage. There are also some old traditions brought back to uh, here, the tradition of the so-called found literary object, the found manuscript, the found letter. This was very common in the 18th century. Now, these are perfectly acceptable. I would add one more thing. Fragmentation doesn't just mean putting these pieces together to, to make a whole. Sometimes there are works of postmodern literature that reject the idea of closure, of completedness. So some works that end up unfinished, some works which are only fragments and they only claim to be fragments. Yeah? There are also some works lying on the bridge, if you wish, between modernism and postmodernism. I would think of Samuel Beckett's short of fiction, for instance, or his plays that display this lack of completeness. One more feature, hybridization. Well, that's not really a real animal, I think. Oh, I don't know, maybe it's a zebra suffering from vitiligo. Anyhow, hybridization, a term that we know from uh, biology, is also invoked by Hassan to speak of what? The freedom to combine the fragments we have just spoken about in new contexts and with very little concern for their harmony or their matching or not matching together. The key word here would be this, anything goes, anything goes. And if you think that's also a word you would use today when you dress up to go to the club. You sometimes had problems with your mother advising you to dress like the lady on the left. Match your purse, shoes, dress, Similar color. Don't dress in mismatching clothes. Don't take boots or sneakers and a gown. But postmodernism just rejects all of this. So instead of this nice, smooth, harmonious outfit, postmodernism has us wear things like that. Hybridization also works in um, along the line of creating new genres, ignoring the uh, traditional limits of the literary genres. Yeah, it's what they call the de-definition of genres, so demolition of genres, and creating new genres. One good example is Truman Capote's attempt to create a piece of fiction that should be based only on documents, and he called that docu-fiction. Well, there are some other examples. For instance, there is. Um, um, a novel entitled The Saltweed Factor by John Barth, in which one of the protagonists is moving from uh, UK to, to America and he's trying to write an heroic epic poem entitled The Marylandiad, which sounds obviously ridiculous. It's inspired by the name of the state of Maryland and it should try to mimic uh, the Iliad or some other, or the Aeneid one of those great epics of the antiquity, and it ends up just looking more like a mock heroic, yeah? like a humorous epic, rather. Indeterminacy. That's another keyword in uh, Hassan. 
uh, when Hassan Yus speaks about this, he has in mind ambiguities, uncertainties that are so dominant in our uh, in our world. If you look at the picture on the left, can be interpreted in in two ways. What do we see there? Huh? Some of you see us uh, two young people sitting at a table and drinking maybe a, a rather irregularly big quantity of wine from several glasses. But if you take a step back, then what you see is a skull. So which is which? Can you say? Or is it both? What did the author mean? Ambiguity. We don't know. There are several keywords we should use. We should look at science. Science used to give us certainties. But contemporary science fed us more on uncertainties. This is Werner Heisenberg, a winner of the 1932 Nobel Prize in Physics. And he's the author of something called Heisenberg's Principle of Uncertainty. The way science is making room for uncertainty. There is a discussion you probably heard in your classes of physics about what is the essence of everything. Is everything matter? Materie, or is everything energy or wave? And physicists like Heisenberg end up saying, well, it's both. Everything is matter. If you regard it from the point of view of the atom that has a mass, but at the same time, everything is wave and therefore energy. If you focus on the movement of the electrons. So both interpretations are true. Okay, this is an image, yeah illustrating uh, Heisenberg's uh, principle of uncertainty. Yeah, You cannot measure the position and momentum of a particle with absolute certainty because everything is in movement. Another uh, scientist, Gödel. Gödel has the so-called uh, proof of incompleteness, which goes about in the same direction, looking at, at statements, uh, physical statements that cannot be ultimately proved. So. In the long run, we end up realizing that there are many ambiguities that affect knowledge and that uncertainty lies at the core of our world. And we have to live with that. Moving on, uh, another feature, the words of the French uh, literary and cultural critic Roland Barthes, who proclaimed la mort de l'auteur, which would mean the death of the author. What does he mean by that? He means that authors begin to to, to be undistinguishable from a certain point on because they all share the same cultural luggage. If you want to find out more about this, there is a link in the Canvas page for the course for on a video. Uncertainty also lies at the core of the work of the philosopher Ludwig Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein took a look at what we consider to be truths, universal truths. And he realized no truth can be absolutely proven right. There's no possibility to do that. And then how do we validate truths? We call a truth something that can be validated by words that were expressed to, to, to speak about another truth. So in, in other words, we end up uh, with words. And he ends up with a very... I know, troubling idea that it's all about language games. We cannot validate truths. We can only look at language games. So all of our sentences or our, our truths are words that validate other words. I said at some point, the limits of my language are the limits of my world. So everything I know about the world lies in language. We cannot know the world outside language. Troubling. Right. Another issue that you spoke about when you discussed the scenes of death in Slaughterhouse Five, yeah, you remember the bombing of Dresden, and the, or when you discussed the uh, terrible, grotesque scene between Todd Andrews and that German soldier in that shell hole. It's the unrepresentable, the unpresentable. There is a problem with contemporary literature. We stick to old themes. We speak about love. We speak about betrayal. We speak about ambition. 
but somehow some of the biggest themes cannot be touched maybe because we don't have the words for it but when you look at this voila the holocaust what can you say are there words to speak about this or when you look at this the victims of the soviet gulag and all the craze in soviet russia what are the words to speak about this or when you look at this the atomic bomb at Hiroshima that annihilated dozens of thousands of lives in, in, in a flash. What can you say about that? So we end up with literature claiming or having to speak about the abject or about what Julia Kristeva called the exchange between signs and death. The next one, and that's going to be our last today, it's irony. Irony, we already had a discussion today. Are we speaking about irony as, as fun, entertainment? Are we speaking of irony as, as mockery? Not necessarily. Postmodern irony is related to perspectivism. In that sense, in which in popular parlance, in popular speech, when we say about a person he has the sense of humor, we sometimes mean that that person can take criticism or that person uh, can look at the other other side of the matter perspectivism would be this voila very nice caricature well what is it for the person at the left that's number six for the person at the right that's number nine well, look at that well again different perspectives the person the shipwrecked guy on the uh, desert island shouts boat whereas the abandoned um, sailor at sea the maroon sailor is happy to see land who's right here well look at that yeah this is a definition of perspectivism as a philosophical term according to which reality is known by the perspectives of each individual or each group at a particular moment and that therefore when we realize this is true, we must accept that there are many possible conceptual schemes, many truths that can exist. And then we might result with this. This is a wonderful caricature. Take a look at it. People who only are able to see reality up close, what do they see? It's a spear. They speak of the elephant's trunks. It's a snake. Someone feeling the trunk it's a tree that person feeling or touching the 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 legs of the elephant it's a wall for for the person that's trying to climb on it the person uh, sitting on top being um, kind of ventilated by the elephant's huge ears says it's a fan whereas the one at the tail thinks he has a rope in his hands that's perspectivism Obviously, we're speaking of several types of irony. Yeah, Hassan says that there are traditional descriptions of irony, the immediate irony, irony which is not immediate, it's not direct, indirect um, irony. Then there is the disjunctive irony, it's the irony that kind of splits reality in two. However, the irony that is typically postmodern is irony that we should call suspensive irony. It's, it's an irony that suspends so, um, suspends the the idea that there is one single perspective one single truth so it's the irony in the theater of the absurd it's the irony of randomness and absurdity obviously if we speak of perspectivism there is a word we would all think of and that is relativity or relativism irony could mean relativism so Obviously, everybody thinks of Albert Einstein and his widely misunderstood theory of generalized relativity. Everybody quotes it, nobody understands it, so we leave it at that. Yeah, We are using, if you wish, uh, the, the term uh, uh, relativism or relativity in a most unscientific word, but we know what we mean. We mean that there is no absolute truth to the postmodern mind. So that was our discussion about postmodernism. There are three more characteristics that I'm going to deal with 
next time. They are more problematic, maybe, maybe less general. And then I'm going to tell you next time about my own approach to postmodernism, a couple of two, three, maybe four terms that I consider very important. For instance, you notice that there was no mention here of metafiction. And we came across a lot of metafiction in these stories. So that was it for it for today. Thank you.